Hello, I'm Caroline Hall. I'm the President of Integrity here in Indianapolis on the historic fifth day of the 77th General Convention of the Episcopal Church. Today, the Church officially declared its welcome to transgender people by adding gender identity and gender expression to the canons which prevent discrimination against lay people and those applying for ordination. In addition, the proposal for a study of marriage has been agreed by both houses and on a three to one vote, blessings for same gender couples were agreed by the House of Bishops. Integrity members, friends and allies, celebrated God's inclusive love in a festive Eucharist celebrated by Bishop Mary Glasspool. As Jesus taught, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Bishop Jean Robinson, who is retiring this year, was the preacher. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. 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 Please be seated. What a day, huh? If the glory of the Lord hasn't shown today, I don't know what day it would be. <laughs> I'm encouraged by something um, in the program tonight. It, it lists this as a teaching. Now, I know how long a sermon is supposed to go in Episcopal churches. <laughs> but as far as I know, there, there are no real boundaries and limits <laughs> for a teaching. So... Go team! So sit back. <laughs> but first, I, I, I have to tell you something, which is that you have no idea what it is like for me to be on this platform with Mary Glasspool. It's because of her I can retire. <laughs> and to be even remotely in the presence of Louis Crew and his beloved Ernest, on whose shoulders we all stand, is just an unspeakable honor. Where are you? I know you're there. I have to say, the, the thing that kept occurring to me today, all day, was, uh, I think some of you know that Psalm 27 is one of my uh, mantras. It has gotten me through some uh, awful times. You know, it's kind of typical of the Psalms, you know, Oh Lord, they're wanting to eat up my flesh and do bad things to me, but you will set me high on a rock. And if only I can sing your song. That's all I want, is to be able to sing your song. But, and I think it's the next to the last verse, it says something that I felt all day today, and I think you'll feel it too if you remember. It says, what if we had not believed 
in the goodness of the Lord. Where would we be today if we had not believed in the goodness of the Lord? Not very far. Look what the goodness of the Lord has done to us. The goodness of the Lord has come shining through to us in so many ways, in scripture and through other people and in the church. And this is a group of people, I think, who are absolutely convinced that the God of all that is loves us beyond anything we can imagine. Now, I have a confession to make. I think confession is good for the soul. I have to tell you that I hate camping. I would have made a lousy lesbian. And, and in fact, um, I, I should have known something was up. Um, I went camping on my honeymoon with my wife it, up on Lake Mbagog, which is on the border of Maine and New Hampshire, an unspeakably beautiful place, where the mosquitoes are bird-sized. <laughs> and the first fight of our married life was inside our tent because there was a mosquito in there who was intent on my not sleeping. And I chased around it until she was so exasperated with me. It makes me wonder how Abraham felt about camping. <laughs> and whether Sarah might have gotten put out with him a, a time or two. We're told that Abraham was sent out not knowing where he was going and that he lived in tents. Many of you, like I, have been in the Sinai Desert and we've slept outside under those amazing stars and from time to time up in a tree you'll see um, um, a, a sort of a wrapped cloth around some poles up in the tree holding some things for the Bedouins who have left them there. So they don't have to carry things from place to place to place and they just leave them in the trees and assume they'll be there when they get back. Abraham was asked to live in tents. And, and the letter to the Hebrews tells us, however, that he and the people with him dreamt of the city that had foundations. They, they, they dreamt of a real honest-to-God city, you know, with, with, with foundations, and that stayed in the same place all the time. But God asked them to live in tents. And I don't know about you, but I know what that feels like because you know what? I, I want some answers to things. I want, I want things to stay where I put them <laughs> and to stay where I think them. And I don't like being asked to move on and then to move on again and to move on again. And yet, it seems to be the biblical witness that God means for us to live in tents and to move from place to place and to never finally settle down until we're all in heaven. And I think we are meant to get used to it, that moving around. And although we can dream about a city with foundations, we are meant to live, in this world at least, in tents. Fast forward to Jesus' time, and the disciples must have felt like they had moved around an awful lot. I mean, Jesus had taken those poor fishermen and just stretched them every which way to Sunday. He asked them to think in new ways and act in new ways and to do new things with very new people that they had never dreamt of. 
And they would love to have just had everything tied down and neat and tidy. And it wasn't to be because God's people are meant to live in tents. And just about the time you get comfortable, God leads you somewhere else. And so on the night before he died for us, Jesus said this really tender thing to them. There is much that I would teach you, but you cannot bear it right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. Now, I take that to mean that Jesus was saying to them, look, you know, for, for a bunch of rough, uneducated fishermen, you haven't done too badly. In fact, in fact, I'm just darn proud of you. But don't you for a minute think that God is done with you or the people who come after you because there is much that I have to teach you. It's just that you can't bear all of it right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. For a long, long time, we used scripture to justify slavery. We've used scripture to denigrate and subjugate women. We have said that people with mental illness actually have demons. We've said the devil is in someone who uses their left hand. We have excluded people in wheelchairs and deaf people and all kinds of people. Do you doubt for a minute that it's the Holy Spirit who has led us into all truth? We are not meant to live in a city with foundations, but we're meant to live in tents. And by God's goodness, we have been led in our time to recognize and begin to accept and affirm and celebrate gay and lesbian, bisexual, and now transgender people. What an astounding time to be alive. Do, do you realize that? That we're actually living to see this? And I think in this moment, at this convention, we have begun that process with our transgender brothers and sisters. And it is a very good thing. I have to tell you that after the uh, trans bills uh, passed in the House of Bishops, uh, last night was my uh, uh, class of bishops um, and spouses dinner. Almost every one of those bishops wanted to talk about transgender and what it meant. I had done this little teaching thing, or I tried, on the floor of the house when someone said, oh, what's this uh, gender identity and gender expression and how is that different? And they all wanted to talk about it. I don't think they had ever uttered the words in their lives. <laughs> and they were like, well, it, it's so like if I'm asked about this, what, what am I going to say? So we did little tutorials around the dinner table, you know. <laughs> that is an astounding thing. When a conservative bishop from a conservative diocese wants to know what gender expression is and what gender identity is and, and ask the theological question like, are, are you saying God made a mistake and, and how do I fit this into... What I know and believe, that is an astounding thing. If that... I mean, th this is a person who, who probably couldn't get out the letters L, G, B, and T without stumbling over them. And yet, they have begun that journey to understand. 
It, it's a miracle, isn't it? It's a miracle. So, so we have already done an amazing thing. And on that journey, I, I have some homework for you to do. I have a, a charge for you. To the trans people who are here, a goodly number of them sitting right here, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you.